So you're ready to start a new project in Go, you're using GitLab, and you want to know how to get started, I'm going to show you. Hi, I'm Jonathan Hall, and I've been programming for many years, and I am a big advocate of continuous integration, continuous deployment, automated testing, and all that good stuff that you should be doing uh, on practically all of your projects. So in this video, I'm going to show you how I like to bootstrap a brand new project on GitLab. If you use GitHub, I'll be creating a video on that topic. There should be a link here once it's out. The content, of course, of these two videos will be essentially the same, but just tailored for either GitHub or GitLab. If you use something else, leave a comment below. Let me know. Uh, if I get enough responses, maybe I'll make yet another video on other platforms. So the very first thing, of course, when you're creating a new project in GitLab is to go over to GitLab and create that project. Now I'm using gitlab.com. I'm using their free open source tier. Uh, maybe you're using a self-hosted version or maybe you've paid for premium support. Your screens may be a little bit different. Your URL may be different, uh, but the concepts are ultimately the same. So let's get started. Obviously you start at gitlab.com. In the top uh, bar, there's a little plus symbol. You can click on that and then choose new project or repository. In this video, we'll only be using a blank project. Uh, the other features are a little bit more advanced and don't really apply. Now this page should be pretty self-explanatory, but I'm gonna walk through the details uh, just to be safe. Um, project name, I'm gonna call this one Skeleton. And I'm gonna put it in the Boldly Go group. I have other groups that I use for other things, but I'm gonna put this in Boldly Go so that you can view it if you want to and, and actually even clone it perhaps uh, and use this as the baseline for your upcoming Go project. To make that possible, I'm gonna make this public. Now, I'm not using a deployment target here. Um, if you're building a project that uh, you deploy directly to Kubernetes or Heroku or these other options, of course, you can do that. For this video, I'm uh, not worried about the project deployment target. Um, and I don't really care about the project configuration options, but just briefly, um, I'll say that I'm going to not do the readme. The only reason really to do the readme, if you want to, is so that GitLab creates the first commit for you. Um, but I want to demonstrate doing that locally today. So I'm unchecking that and that readme is kind of worthless anyway and i'm not worried about the security testing for this project let's hit create project all right so here's my brand new completely empty project that has zero commits no branches nothing it's empty i'm going to click on clone and i'm going to copy the ssh url and i'm going to head over to my terminal and do some local work here i'm going to run git clone and the url i just copied from my browser and it will tell you uh, that you've cloned an empty repository, but that's expected because we knew it was an empty repository. Let's change to that directory. And now I'm gonna initialize my Go project. And uh, the way you do that uh, is with the go mod init command. So you just type go space mod space init space, and then the full path to your package. And that full path includes gitlab.com or your URL and the group name, and then the, the repository name. So in my case, that's gitlab.com slash boldly go slash skeleton. So what this does is it creates a go.mod file for me. We can cat that file, and you see that it's a very simple file so far. Uh, it contains, the first line is the word module, a space, and then that package name, I, or the package path I provided. And then it tells us which version of Go it's built for. Go 1.19, of course, it defaults to the version of Go you're running. I want to add this uh, file to my uh, Git repository. So I'll do a git add go.mod, and then I'm gonna create a commit. So now I've created my first commit, uh, and it has automatically created the first branch for me. Um, if I run git branch, it will show me that that branch is called master. That's the default name that Git uses. If I had created this in GitLab, it would have defaulted to main rather than master. Um, you can also use whatever branch name you want, even with Git. I'm just sticking to the defaults today because that's not really the point of this video. Now I want to push this initial commit up to GitLab. Now if I hop over again to the GitLab repository, I can refresh the page and it should no longer tell me it's empty. Now I can see that there's a file, go.mod. It contains the contents I expect and so on. Now we have an empty Go module that has no Go files and it has no 
automated tests. It has nothing going on here. Uh, what's the next step? Well, the next step, I think, is to create actual Go file uh, that contains Go code. Uh, and then we're going to build uh, from there. So let me head back over to my local working copy. And I'm going to open up my editor. I use VS Code here. Now I'm going to create a simple file. Uh, one convention I often use is to create a file called doc.go in each package. And that uh, just contains the, the package name and then some go doc about the package. And I think that's a great way to demonstrate this today. So let me create a new file. And then I type package and let's call this skeleton. Now if I save that, it asks me for a file name. I'm going to call it doc.go. Now the reason I call it doc.go is because I put documentation in here. Uh, so let me add that. So that should fairly well explain the purpose of this package. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, add this to my repository. I'm going to create a branch called doc uh, to update this. Add my doc.go. Then I commit it. And then I will push the doc branch up to GitLab. Let's go back to the GitLab interface. Now, if I hit refresh again, we will see uh, that it has detected the new branch and it offers me the option to create a merge request, which I will do. Now, in this case, I'm just going to use all the defaults. Uh, if you uh, are doing this on a, on a real project or on more substantial code, you probably want to put in a proper description. Um, but uh, this is a simple thing, so I'm just going to create merge request. All right, so here's my new mer uh, merge request. Uh, I can click on the changes tab and see that I've added a file with three lines uh, that contains my little GoDoc snippet and the, the package skeleton. And it can be merged. Uh, so let's go ahead and merge that. Now back on my local copy. I'm going to check out master again, and I'm going to pull down the latest version, which should just include the small change I made. This is fun. Uh, newer versions of Git uh, will ask you to configure uh, your defaults, so I'm going to do that here. So I prefer the fast forward only option, uh, so I'm going to do git config pull.ff only. Um, that's really the best practice. Uh, you should not be creating uh, merge. Uh, merge commits when you're uh, pulling in newer versions of master. Now the git branch minus minus merged option will show you a list of any branches you have that have already been merged. Um, and in this case it shows me that doc has already been merged so I can delete that branch locally. Alright, so now I have uh, the, the minimum Go package uh, created, which allows me to run Go test. If you see, I can run that here. Uh, it doesn't actually run any tests, but it succeeds and it, and it doesn't fail. Uh, so that's really useful for the next step, which is setting up automatic test running in my CI config. So let's open up the file to configure that, which is called .gitlab-ci.yaml. Now, if you're not familiar at all with GitLab CI, uh, there's a great tutorial. I'll have a link to that in the description below. Um, I'm going to just walk you through the way I do it. Uh, this is a little bit uh, different focus, of course, because it's not a, a Go-specific focus. Um, but it's great documentation, and GitLab's uh, CI configuration is well documented. It's also incredibly powerful and complex, so you can, you can spend a lot of time going down rabbit holes. Uh, but this tutorial is a great place to start if you're not familiar at all. Um, but let me just show you what I'm going to do. So in my editor, I'm going to open a file called .gitlab-ci.yml. Of course, the file doesn't exist, so it's empty right now, and that's as expected. Now, there are many, many options. I'm not going to go through anywhere near all of them. Um, I'm just going to do the minimum necessary to get your project going. Uh, again, I recommend the GitLab documentation uh, for more. But the minimum we need is we need to define our stages. And to start with, we have a single stage and I'm going to call it test. And then we define a job, and I'm going to call this job test, and I need to specify which stage it's in. 
in its test. So it's a, a job called test in the stage called test. We need to specify which Docker image to run uh, to use to run this job. And I'm going to use Golang 1.19. If you're watching this in the future, you probably want to use 1.20 or 1.21, etc., etc. And you can actually create multiple jobs if you want to to run against different versions of Go if you're building a library or something that needs to support multiple versions. I'm keeping it simple for this video. Now, there's really only two things I want this job to do. Um, and the, the first one doesn't actually matter yet, but it will for your project. So I'm going to go ahead and include it. So I'm going to put this in the before script. And the command is go mod download. And what this does is, of course, download any requirements, any dependencies that your package depends on. This package has no dependencies, uh, so it's going to do nothing. Uh, but it's good to have it there because your project almost certainly will have dependencies that should be downloaded. And then the script itself is going to run go test with the race detector, and it runs all the tests in uh, in the, the repository rec recursively. So so that's it. That that's that's my entire CI configuration for now. Uh, let's commit this and push it up to GitLab and see what happens. Again, I need a branch. So I'm creating a branch called CI. I'm adding the new file. And I'm committing it. Let's push the branch up to GitLab. All right, over on GitLab here, I see that it has detected the new branch again. Uh, and it asked me to create a merge request, which I'm going to do. Now you'll notice that there's a pipeline running now. Uh, that pipeline I just defined is now running. So let's let's see what that does. So we can watch the pipeline in action. Uh, it's downloading a Docker image, and then boom, it's done. Uh, it downloaded the Go modules, and there were none, so it was immediately finished. And then it executed the go test command. Uh, there were no test files, so it immediately finished. Job succeeded. Yay. Let's go back to our merge request. And now we'll see that the, the pipeline shows the, the green check mark because it succeeded. Uh, so now I can merge. Now we are ready to configure GitLab uh, to sort of lock down the security around this repository. My goal here is to keep master in a pristine, executable, running, uh, ready-to-release state. So I want to protect my master branch uh, and, and ensure that anything that is merged into master has passed all the tests I've defined, which are zero right now, but in the future will be more, um, and uh, that people can't just push to master willy-nilly. So let's, let's do that. Click over on Settings on the left-hand side. And then there's two places we're going to look at. Initially, of course, there's many options here, but there's two areas we're concerned about uh, for this video. Uh, the first one is repository and then branch defaults. Now, by default, the default branch, again, master, is protected, uh, which basically means I can't delete it uh, or that it, you know other people can't uh, do certain things to it. But I want to be more strict than the default. In particular, I don't want to allow anybody to merge or to push directly to master. Uh, so we can merge to master through the mechanism of a merge request, which executes the CI scripts, but nobody can push directly to master. So that's important here. That's the whole point of visiting this page. After that, I want to go over again on the left-hand side under settings. I want to go to merge requests. And there's several tweaks I want to make here. Now I'm going to walk you through each of these. Uh, a, lo a lot of this is my opinion, and uh, your opinion very likely differs and your circumstance and your team working arrangements will differ. Uh, so I'm going to explain each of these and explain why I have my preference, and then you can make your own preference decision. So we have three options here with the merge method. Merge commit, merge commit with semi-linear history, and fast forward merge. Let me explain the first and the last, and then I'll explain the middle option. Merge commit uh, will create a new generally empty commit every time you merge. Uh, the, the exception could be if there's a, a conflict that has to be resolved during the merge, um, but that's a, a rare exception, hopefully. Um, so in general, what this means is that uh, suppose you have a, a pull request or a merge request with 10 commits in it, 
Uh, meanwhile, while you've been working on this, somebody else on your team has made some changes and pushed them to master. Uh, now when this merge commit happens, the, your, your colleagues changes and yours are sort of joined at this, this empty merge commit. Um, fast forward merge, uh, is different in that it won't allow you to merge at all if master has changed. In other words, if your colleague has made a change to master since you, uh, checked out master. So in this case, you would have to rebase or, or possibly merge, but please don't do that. You'd have to rebase your changes on top of the current version of master, and then you can uh, merge with the fast forward. And there is no merge commit. There's that, that little empty uh, merge commit doesn't exist. The sort of middle option is this merge commit with semi-linear history. It gives you the same restriction that your changes must be current with the current version of master. In other words, master cannot have diverged uh, since your version of master, but it also creates that merge commit that's empty. The reason I prefer this approach is I the, the fast forward a boldness is valuable in that it ensures that there's no invisible merge conflicts. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. But it's also valuable because I like that merge commit because it makes it easier to revert the entire merge request if you ever need to. Now what I mean by invisible uh, conflicts, uh, suppose that Bob is working on a feature that depends on the file foo but doesn't change it. Meanwhile, Alice deletes file foo. These two changes would merge without a git conflict, but they wouldn't work together because of that invisible conflict. Uh, so by uh, so so in other words, both Alice's changes and Bob's changes, they would both appear to work in isolation. They would both pass the CI test, but if you actually merge them together, they would break because Bob's capability depends on this file that has now been deleted. So by requiring this fast forward capability, that's never possible. Uh, as soon as Bob uh, fast forwards or, or rebases his work on top of Alice's, his CI will start to fail because foo has been deleted. So that's what that protects against. Let's move on. Merge options. The important one here is the last one, but let me talk about the other two since we're on this page automatically resolve merge request diff threads when they become outdated. If you're doing pull request reviews with your teammates and somebody makes a comment on one of your changes, say this variable is mistyped or misnamed or something like that, enabling this option would hide that or, or resolve that uh, conversation as soon as you change that line. The, the danger there is that maybe you make a change to that line that isn't actually fixing the comment. So you decide whether it's a good approach or not. Next, we have show link to create or view a merge request when pushing from the command line. All that does is add a little bit of text uh, that in response to the git push command that gives you a URL that you can jump straight to to create a merge request. I've never cared about that, but maybe it's useful for somebody. Uh, it's never hurt me either, so I, I have no opinion whether it's good or bad. The last one, though, I do think is important. Enable delete source branch option by default. Uh, if you've ever worked on a project without this feature, uh, you probably have seen dozens, if not hundreds, of stale merged branches sitting around, and then somebody has to go through and clean them up manually. Such a pain in the butt. Uh, this prevents that. Um, it doesn't actually enforce the deletion. What it does is on the merge request page, it enables a check mark to automatically delete it by default. You can still uncheck it if you want to for some reason on a particular merge request, uh, but by default, it becomes enabled. So I do highly encourage leaving that check mark there. Next, on this one, opinions will vary. Uh, I have a strong opinion, uh, and I'll explain it. Uh, many other people have very strong opinions that contradict mine. What is squash commits uh, when merging? Uh, once again, let's imagine that your pull request contains 10 commits. Uh, if you enable squash commits on merging, that will be squashed. All those 10 commits will be squashed into a single commit at merge time. So uh, that, that makes your Git history much cleaner, uh, much more concise. Uh, but the reason I don't like it is because it also makes that history much less valuable, much less useful. Now, I, I am a big fan of doing selective squashing that's controlled by a person uh, using interactive rebase, for example. I think that's really valuable. I don't want necessarily 25 commits that all say fix typo, fix typo, fix typo. Uh, that's not very valuable but I don't want to necessarily uh, just automatically merge, uh, squash all of my uh, changes into a single commit. So 
this is why I always do do not allow. Um, there are exceptions. Uh, I work on a couple projects uh, that are mostly documentation where require probably makes sense because you know there, there's not there's not really that that uh, programmer's logic to to be unwound or to be un, undis uncovered by looking through the history. Uh, it's just human readable text. Uh, that history is much less valuable in that sort of context. Um, and of course, there are teams that strongly prefer the, the require option. They just don't like the maybe the, the tedium of manually squashing things. I think it's worth it, but um, that's why I say do not allow, and many of you will disagree with me and prefer to do something else, and that's fine. Merge checks. Uh, this one's important. Pipelines must succeed. Uh, that's kind of the whole point of this video. Uh, the point here is to build a, a, a project that we have reliable CI configuration so that master is always good and, and ready to go. That's what this does. By checking this, you will not be able to merge a pull request that breaks your tests. And then the next option here, all threads must be resolved. That's a decision between you and your teammates. Um, are you doing pull request reviews or not? If you're only using GitLab CI to ensure that your tests run successfully, you probably don't want this. Or if this is a solo project, you probably don't want this. Uh, so you decide amongst you and your team what to do here. Now on this page, for some reason, GitLab has this save button. On other pages, as we saw before, it automatically saves the changes. But, but that's it. Um, so I've configured GitLab uh, the way I want it to be configured for this. Let's jump back over to my local machine and start to flesh out this configuration a little bit more. Now, one really important thing uh, for a project like this that's intended to be open source, because I want you to be able to clone it and use it if you want to, is it needs an open source license. Now, if you have a private repository at work, you probably don't need this, but if you are doing a public uh, project, be sure to put a license. Even if you don't want one, just put a license file in that says, you don't have permission to use this. I've seen that a few times. So once again, I'm gonna check out master. Pull down the latest changes, delete my stale branch, and now I'm going to create a new branch for this license file. Now I'm going to use the MIT license. Uh, it's very, very permissive, and it gives you complete permission to use this as a skeleton if you want to. I happen to have a copy of that in my home directory. So let me just copy it here. You can see what it looks like. Copyright 2023, Jonathan Hall. Blah, blah, blah. Let's create a commit. Now, while I'm here, why don't I create a readme also? Yeah. Could be a readme.txt or markdown. Markdown is a little bit nicer. Simple enough. No frills. Let's add that. And let's push this up to GitLab. Here's that URL we just talked about uh, on the uh, options page. Uh, if you remove that check mark, then, then this uh, little URL won't show up here. If I refresh the page, once again, it has detected the new branch and prompts me to create a merge request, which I'm going to do. Let's change this to add license in readme. Now here you see that delete source branch I was talking about before. Uh, if I had unchecked that option on the previous page, then this would be unchecked by default, uh, but it is checked by default. You'll also notice there's not the option to squash the commits here. It, it was there before. If you rewind the video, you'll probably see it. Uh, but since I said that squashed commits are not permitted, that checkbox is now gone. The pipeline has already committed, uh, completed, uh, as you might expect. An annoying little bug in GitLab, I guess it's a bug, is that this merge when pipeline succeeds doesn't change to merge when the pipeline completes. If I click this now, it's going to give me an error. But if I refresh the page, it shows me the merge button. GitLab, would you fix that, please? It's annoying. So let me merge my merge request. Now that's done. Back here. Once again, pull down the latest version. Now there's one last thing I want to do 
uh, in this video, and that is I want to add the linter to this project. I think that's really important. It's one of the easiest ways to uh, reduce the number of bugs in your code. If you're not familiar with the linter, I have another video on that topic. There'll be a, a link up here or in the description uh, that really provides a nice introduction to the Golang linter. Uh, but I want to configure that for this project. Of course, there's no real code in this project, so the linter is not going to find anything, but it's still a nice uh, thing to add. So the, the first thing here is I want to open up my GitLab uh, uh, configuration again, and I'm going to add a new job called linter. Now I want to run the linter job in the same stage, so I'm going to call it test. So all that does is it allows both of these jobs to run concurrently. Now the linter we're using is called Golang CI Lint, and they have their own Docker image, uh, which I'm going to be using here. And the latest version of that image uh, as of this recording is version 1.50.1. That's what I'm using here. And then as before, I'm going to use the same before script. To go mod download. And the reason for that is uh, some of the linters, though not all, do require that any dependencies uh, are already downloaded. Uh, that's to do uh, resolution of uh, data types and so on and so forth. And then the script itself. is the simple golang ci lint run command uh, which runs the configured linters uh, recursively on the entire project now there's one other piece missing from here and that is the configuration for the linter itself uh, i don't necessarily need that configuration the linter will by default use uh, some default settings uh, but it's really good to create your own uh, and in fact that's what the video i mentioned before is all about it is about my uh, default uh, configuration. So I'm going to copy in my default configuration. So I have the default, my my default configuration in my home directory again. It's in the .golangci.toml, or you can use the YAML if you prefer. I'll put that in my local directory. So now I need to add my changes. Oh, I forgot to create a branch, so let me do that now. Oh, it's linter. Let me push that up to GitLab. All right, let's hop back over to GitLab. And we should see, of course, the prompt to create a new merge request. And this time our pipeline should have two jobs in it. Let's see if that works. There we have the two jobs. They're both running simultaneously as expected. Let's uh, hop over to the linter one. We already know that the test should be working since that hasn't changed. Uh, we can see it's downloading the correct uh, Golang CI lint Docker image. And there it goes, uh, it's run. Now the, it looks like the configuration I copied has some uh, old deprecated linters in it. Uh, I must've copied an old uh, copy, that's fine. I'll update that uh, offline. Uh, so that if you choose to clone this project, you have a more uh, pristine updated version. But that's it. Here we are back at the merge request. You can see both jobs, the linter and the test suite, have passed successfully. So now we can merge this merge request. Let's hop back to the top level of the repository and see what we've done. So I've created a uh, skeleton Go repository. Uh, it contains a small number of files, a license that gives you permission to use it, a readme file that explains the purpose, um, a doc.go file that explains the purpose, the go.mod, and then our CI configuration and our linter configuration. So that's really it. You're ready to rock and roll. Uh, start building, uh, clone this if you want, and start building your Go projects off of it. Uh, your tests will be run automatically, and your linter will be run automatically. Uh, tweak your linter config as you wish, uh, add your tests and go wild. If you have found this video to be helpful, I hope you'll like it. Uh, if you like other content like this, be sure to subscribe so that you get notified when I create more of this content for you. And if you have any questions or comments, of course, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, leave those comments down below and I hope to see you soon. Until then, boldly go.